Richard Sloma uh, with the New York State Archives. Welcome to today's presentation uh, of Foundations of Scanning Photographs. Today's presenter is Ken Stutz. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box to the lower left side of your screen and I will let Kent know and then he'll answer them during this presentation. Uh, just want to let people know too that there will be a recording available of this presentation um, after about an hour after we're done. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Kent. Hey, how are you doing today? I am so excited about this webinar. This is actually the, my favorite one in the series that we are doing this, uh, this fall. So as you know, this foundation series has been focusing on key aspects of records management. And scanning historical photographs really doesn't fall within that. It's more of an archival topic. But it is something that I'm really excited about and, and happy to discuss with you today. So please feel free to ask any questions as you go along. Um, I hope that you don't have technical difficulties. Perhaps, you know, if you're here, you probably haven't. But as Rich said, we will be recording this. And uh, we'll be providing information how to get to those on the uh, basically the same Blackboard site. So you should have received a copy of not only the webinar booklet so that you can write down your uh, shopping list or, you know, start your Christmas shopping list a little bit early, and that could be helpful. Also, I hope that you received a copy of the State Archives Guideline for Digital Imaging. We're going to be referencing that through the, uh, the course of our webinar today. We may go a little bit late today because I've tried to put too much stuff into this. There's so many exciting things to learn that it's hard to kind of limit it. But um, Anyway, I'm, I'm tickled to, uh, to be with you today. Today we're going to talk about basic elements. We really only have time to talk about the basics, but I hope that this webinar just totally blows your mind. Because for so many years, I simply just slapped down photographs on my scanner, scanned them, and I thought I was doing a great job. Then I took a number of courses at lynda.com, lynda spelt with a Y, L-D-Y-N-A, lynda.com, and they have amazing offerings for very, very inexpensive. Anyway, I took like five courses on scanning, and my mind was just absolutely opened up to how to do this professionally and in a way that you really, really get everything you can out of a photograph. So we'll talk about equipment and workflow. We're going to talk about color and the proper specifications for scanning. We're going to talk about how to create use versus master images. And maybe a little bit about restoration at the end with our use images. But this is going to be a lot of fun. You could spend billions of dollars doing this, but there are some key, very basic principles that if you follow, you are going to end up with really, really greater images. So why do we digitize? Why do we even bother with this? Well, for one thing, it really does help us to preserve the original photographs. We don't have to pull them out. We don't have to do wear and tear. And so you're not using the originals. You're basically using digital images of the original. And this can also help you organize your digital images. As you know, organizing photographs, print photographs or slides, is one of the most excruciatingly difficult thing to do um, as archivists. It's just really hard. And digitizing photographs can really make these, these images much more accessible. And in a way, now with technology, we can share them. We can so many different options to make them available to people that before we couldn't. And also, there is an issue of digital conservation. We can repair use copies. We can restore them. 
uh, using software. And uh, this can be a great, great help if we want to use them in publications or in other settings. So that's, these are reasons why I think it's just the best thing ever. Well, what can you scan? This is really a question of what kind of money you have. It really comes down to equipment. If you have the right kind of equipment, you can scan just about everything. You can scan reflected printed images. You can scan glass plate negatives, slides, or negative film. The sky is the limit depending upon what kind of equipment you have. So these are the five basic kinds of equipment you might consider using to scan. And some of these work really great and others don't with photographs. You'll note, hey, look at this. I've got this cool thing. Over here, you have a flatbed scanner. And these come in all different varieties. There are, and they're not born equally, there are scanners that really are meant to be photographic scanners, high-end nice scanners. You can buy a, an entry-level photographic scanner for $200. And you can go up to $800 and more. But you can get into this without spending a billion dollars. And so um, this, is a good, this is a good investment. And over here, you have a PlusTech um, film or slide scanner. This is really what you need if you have tons of film or slide materials. You are going to get a significantly better scan using this than you will any of these other products. Well, generally speaking, this kind of a planetary scanner is not going to be used for photographs. It may be in some rare instances that we'll talk a little later. Generally, that's not it. And if you have one of these cheese wagons, a three-in-one, you know, scanner, printer, write it to school, the, the quality that you're going to get with this is going to be so poor that you might as well not even do it. I mean, if that's all you have and it's the end of the world, then fine. But uh, generally speaking, this is not going to give you what you need. Don't even think about it. And here we have a nice, a nice um, automatic self-feeding scanner. You're obviously not going to be using this. Just send through 100 photographs a minute. That's not going to work. Oh, I didn't mention that the, um, the film scanner up here, they run anywhere from about $275 to $500. So here, between 200 to 800, 800 being the nicest film Flat, um, flatbed scanner, and these run between 275 and 500. So between the two of those, you really, if you had a wide range of uh, different things you needed to scan, you would you would be able to take care of it with that very nicely. Hey Kent, uh, now, this is Rich. I was just going to mention. Um, I think you're pointing. I, I can't see the pointer though. The laser pointer. I don't know. If you can't see the pointer. Yeah, I, I can't, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Maybe if somebody could just uh, confirm that you are, in fact, pointing to the different uh, items on the I'm screen. Can anybody else, can anybody see that? Is it just me? I'm having such a time. I'm having such a fun time pointing, and you can't even see it. What the heck? Hey, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it here. Does anybody see me pointing? I see you pointing. OK. All right, let me change my pointer. All right, do you see me now? I see you now. Hot dog. Hey, I can't get rid of that. Well, anyway, who cares? Just click um, on it again there, Ken. I think you just click on it a second time and then... Uh, yeah, the I'm not going to click on it a second time. So, um, today's webinar is not about scanning slides and negatives. We're going to focus our attention on... Uh, what are referred to as reflective images or print images because what you have to do to do a full-scale webinar on just slides and negatives is beyond the scope. But I just wanted to show you this. So we know that with a flatbed scanner that the nicer ones, this is a really nice one, the Epson Perfection 
um, V750 Pro. Really, really nice. Um, it comes with a nice little slide holder, and you can put film or slide in there. This is not really what you want if you want the absolute best quality scan for slides and negatives. This is for limited use, um, medium quality. Really, the dedicated film scanner is what you want if you're doing a lot of slides and images. So let's just talk one more slide about doing slides and negatives, how to mount them. There's really three ways to do this, and it's kind of good, better, best. This is simply using the uh, attachment in the scanner. It's a dry scan. It's, there's no glass mount. It, you just simply plop them in the little holder and, and scan away. And the quality for this is pretty good. The next level is using a dry scan in glass. Basically, you're using two pieces of glass. You've, remo you've removed the photographic material from the slide or from, you know, it's a negative. And you basically mount it between two clean plastic pieces of glass, but there is no um, liquid. In the final and in the best way to do it, and this is how the real professionals do it, they put it between glass and they use this fabulous cami, I don't know how to pronounce this, the scanner, <laughs> scanner mounting fluid to basically make the highest level quality scans for slides and negatives. So. I just wanted to put that out there. We're not talking about this per se, but just so you know, there's kind of a good, better, best in terms of sli um, scanning slides and negatives. You're going to have to excuse me today. I've got strep throat, and I'm on some drugs that are kind of making me a little high, so I'm having a hard time speaking the way I should. Well, which one of these does not belong? These are scanning supplies. Which one of these would you never use? Any idea? It's Q-tips. You never use a Q-tip. Never. Never, never, never. Clean your ears. I don't care what you do with them. Take off your makeup, but don't use them in photographic settings because well, you think they're rather soft. You stick them in your ear and whatever you do with them, you feel like they're soft, but actually they're very abrasive. And so as you consider the kinds of supplies you may need to do a professional scanning job, let's look at these. This is a nice little brush. You can brush stuff off the, the print photograph. This is sort of fun. It looks like a rocket ship, but actually it's a little blower. You whoosh, 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 and it scoots the dust off your stuff. Pec 12 is kind of cool. Now why does that why does that little, can you see the little hand sticking out? I don't know where that's coming from. It's, the PEC-12 is... Me, Kent. I'm sorry. I'm just helping. <laughs> that's all right. The PEC-12 is kind of an interesting solution. This is used for modern slides and film. It's kind of a cleaning agent. You would never use it on a print photograph. You would never use water on a print photograph, the emulsion layer can get totally messed up, especially the older historical photographs. Never, never, never use anything wet to clean your photographs. Use a little, use the, you see down here, this is a, a micro cloth, and these are peck pads. Both of those are really, really soft. And you can clean off any, like let's say there's a little pizza stain on your photograph, kind of rub it a little bit, kind of try to get that goo off of there because whatever you, is on the photograph, you're going to scan. So if somebody's dropped their luncheon on a photograph, you kind of want to get it off. But you just really can't, I mean, professional people who know emulsions and this and that, maybe they've got some secret stuff, but I've never figured it out and I don't want to ruin my photographs. This gust in a can is pretty cool. This is like the high-powered one like this. And so you can use this to kind of clean off your scanner a little bit, get the dust out of the way, very nice. Um, and if you kind of want that wind-blowing look when you go in the office, you just kind of give your hair a shot, and boom, you're looking like Robert Redford or 
a more modern equivalent if you're under 50. This is the key to your happiness right here. These little cheesy, cheap cotton gloves. They make non-static gloves that you can buy a pair for $25, but I've found that these cheesy little cotton white gloves are the best. You never want to touch your scanner without using these. And you never want to touch your photograph without these because your hands are all full of grease and oil. They look clean, but there's all kinds of goo that you don't want on your scanner. And cleanliness is really, really important. So you want to create a proper environment for scanning. Really think about having an area that's big enough it's a nice, flat surface. It's big enough for your entire workflow. You're going to have your scanner, your screen or screens. If you like to have plenty of screen real estate, you might have two or three. You don't need that. I'm just sort of bragging. Um, you're going to want room for your images and your cleaning supplies. And so that takes some space. And you want to create a nice ergonomic env environment. And you want it to be dust free. Dust is your biggest, most difficult enemy to fight because if you have, if there's static electricity and there's dust on your images, dust on your scanner, you're going to be trying to remove that stuff for the rest of your life. So avoid cloth surfaces. They have a tendency to be kind of staticky and maybe create a little dust. Don't work in an area where there's a lot of cross ventilation. You don't want a, a big air conditioning vent right next to your, your work area. And you don't want a place where people are just walking back and forth. You don't want that at all. You want it to be kind of calm. And what's really important is that you want to set up your scanner in an area that's um, you don't have like a heating vent right next to the scanner. You're not next to a window. Um, because you're trying to avoid fluctuations in temperature. We're going to talk about calibrating your scanner in a bit. And quite honestly, when you calibrate your scanner, it's calibrated at a particular temperature. If, you're, if your scanner is sitting in sun or sitting next to a cold winter, uh, window, it's actually going to impact the quality of your scans. It's going to change the color of your scans, which is really weird. So as we noted, wear these cotton gloves every time. Clean your scanner before every session. Oh, I didn't, I didn't show you. Um, let's just go back. This is so fun. You see this? The same kind of material that you can spray on your cloth and clean your computer screen, you can clean the platen or the glass surface of your scanner. Don't use harsh chemicals or, or crazy stuff. Use a bona fide screen cleaner and, and keep it really nice and clean. That's really quite important. Always use the proper cleaning tools. Don't use things that are going to scratch or make smudges. And push the, the, the dust away from your work area. And one thing that people like to do if you just have your, so you're scanning a bunch of photographs and you just leave them out overnight, when you come back, there's going to be a little dust. So keep them in containers or in an envelope or something, uh, or cover them with a lint-free microcloth so that you don't have that accumulation. Well, there are four basic kinds of reflective images. There's line art, which, or documents, which are just bitonal images. They're black and white. They are, there are grayscale drawings. They're detailed drawings. We refer to them as grayscale. They have 250, uh, the potential of 256 shades of gray. And then there's black and white photographs. These are also grayscale. Uh, the guy at the end is my father in his lederhosen. And finally, there are color photographs. And uh, we are working in the RGB color environment, or red, green, and blue. And so we refer to them as RGB color. The weirdest thing I figured out or learned was that scanners do not, do not capture color. F um, digital cameras do not capture color. 
they capture three channels of grayscale that output devices like your phone, your monitor, your printer, it, these different output devices convert these three channels of grayscale, red, green, and blue, into color. And so we'll talk a lot about this issue, um, about how to work with color and, and this RGB um, scale. This seems a little technical, but it's going to make sense in a second. So we identified the different kinds of reflective images you might scan, and these correlate to these three types of bit depths. And, and all other bit depths that you may see on a scanner in the software relate to these. One bit black and white. Again, this is line art or documents. When you scan a document, you're scanning it one bit because it's really just black or white, a bitonal image. You generally would use 8-bit black and white, which for grayscale images, this provides 256 shades. And then again, color is 24-bit. Now, let, let me show you what that looks like. So here is the, um, <clears throat> the software that ships with Epson scanners. And you notice here, here is the color option. That's 24-bit RGB, red, green, blue. Here's the grayscale for images. And here's the black and white for documents or line art. So it kind of, the, the bit depth thing sort of makes sense when you look at it like that. Let's talk about scanning resolution. Everybody says, the biggest question people have is, what resolution should I scan my images at? And so we're going to spend quite a bit of time sort of analyzing this so that you have a really good working knowledge of, of where you should be. And I should tell you that our digital imaging guidelines talk about this quite in detail and are extremely helpful for different kinds of photographic and documents. Really, really good. So here's the first principle. When you think about what the highest resolution that various output devices can use in terms of converting continuous tone images or print images, here's what you end up with. 100 ppi, that's pixels per inch, for web publishing. It used to be 72 pixels per inch was the recommendation. But now, with our, um, what are they, monitors having such higher resolution, um, many web developers have gone to 95 ppi. And it's just easier to go to 100. So the maximum that your, your monitor is going to be able to use is 100 pixels per inch. Now, you'll note that the next ones, the laser printer, the standard inkjet commercial printing, these are measured in dots per inch, or DPI. There's a difference. A dot per inch is actually a, a <laughs> I mean, you could, you could think of it as a dot on the page, whereas in an electronic um, environment, we're going to talk about pixels per inch. So either way, sometimes they're used interchangeably, but there really is a difference. The highest, the highest resolution that your standard laser printer can print a continuous tone image is 200 dpi. It may say that you can select 600 dpi or 1200 dpi, but when it converts a continuous tone image, a scanned image, and prints it, 200 dpi is the highest that it can, it can create. If you have a standard inkjet printer, 240 dpi. If you take it to the average commercial printing house, 300 dpi. And if you own a fabulous photographic inkjet printer, you can push it to about 360. So basically, these are the highest output resolutions that you can get out of your equipment. And if you think about this, if you were to scan at 400 dpi, actually 400 ppi, because you're scanning in pixels per inch, um, it would cover you 
just to meet the needs of your output resolutions, your output equipment. This is the first important point. And stick with me. This is a little confusing, but it'll be great. So here are two images. Note the one on the upper left, how it's just a little blurry. It's not quite as fine. There's more detail. It's much more refined, this image here. This image on this side was scanned at a lower resolution, and then we tried to increase the size of it. So let's say we have we scanned it at, um, well, I'm not, we don't have time for that. So basically, basically the principle here is once you've scanned something, you can downsize the image. You can make it smaller for your needs, for your use needs, and the quality turns out just great. Downsizing an image is almost never a problem. But increasing the size of the image or upsizing it, once you scan it at a lower resolution, creates a very, very poor output image. And that's not what we want. So that's principle number two. Always scan to the highest resolution that you think you're going to use. So here are some golden rules. To determine the optimal, optimal scanning resolution, first of all, you want to consider how you're going to use it. What kind of a device are you going to ever want to output it on? And as we noted before, 400 dpi is about the highest that you'll ever need. Now, it's conceivable that as we go into the future, they'll develop different kinds of output devices, whether they're um, printers or monitors or whatever that could use a higher. But 400 is pretty good. And then you want to adjust that highest output potential based on the image size. If you have a small image that you know when you use it in a, a publication that you're going to want to increase its size, maybe take something that's a very small image and pump it up to a medium size image, you're going to have to adjust the resolution that you scan that original image to make sure that when you make it larger in your publication that it's going to be a higher quality or as high a quality an image as you want. Also, I hope that this isn't too confusing. The last thing is that every scanner has optimal optical resolutions. That is to say that the actual equipment itself has optimal settings where it can scan at its highest quality. And you don't want to exceed that. And so there are ways to use the software to beef up or to scan at higher resolutions above the optical resolution of your scanner. And you can find out what that optical resolution, the maximum, is in, in your um, tech leaflet that comes with it. But you generally don't want to exceed the optical resolution of your scanner, which varies dramatically depending upon its qualities. So if you put all these three things together, you always want to scan at the highest anticipated resolution so that you don't later have to upscale your images when you go to use them. So here's just a couple of examples. So here's a laser printer. We know that we can output at 200 dpi. And let's say you want to increase the size of a 2 by 4 inch original photograph. You want to increase it 50%. You want to, in your, in your magazine or in your um, newsletter, in your publication, you want it to be 3 by 6. Well, you would have to increase the resolution that you scan at it to 300. The same thing with an inkjet. Let's say you have a photo you want to double its size. You'd have to scan it at 480 ppi. If you have a, com a, a commercial job, you're going to send something to a commercial printer. 
you may be, and you need to increase the size of a particular photograph, you may be scanning it, need to scan it at 600 pixels per inch. So this just kind of gives you a kind of a sample of the kind of thinking that you have to go through. And we're really talking about large scale scanning. You can, if you're just scanning a few photographs at a time, you can make these adjustments very, very, unif very, very specific for a particular image. But if you're scanning hundreds, maybe thousands of photographs, you need to come up with a, a um, resolution that you can do a higher scale of scanning. So let's simplify this. All that's been very complicating, I know. The absolute lowest you want to scan images, your print images, is 400 pixels per inch. And this is only when there's no scaling or you'll not anticipate that you'll have to increase the size. Quite honestly, I scan almost everything at 600 PPIs because that is a really good, um, a very, very good resolution for most photographs. It gives you a little bit of space for upscaling. And I find that over 600 PPI, you sometimes start picking up um, issues. It actually allows you to see issues in the, the photograph that you don't want to pick up. And it also, you can pick up emulsion and other irregularities. So there may be situations where you're scanning very, very little photographs. Like maybe you come across something that's a one inch by one inch or a one inch by three inch. And you will have to increase that. You may increase it to 800 PPI. You may even increase it to 1200 DPI. But generally speaking, for, for mass scanning purposes, 600 PPI works really, really great. Uh, Kent? Yes. I have a question from Rebecca, and I think we're at a good point here to answer it. She asks, why not just scan everything at one resolution, the highest? Well, what is the highest resolution? That's the question. And, and, and that's really what we're suggesting here, Rebecca. That is absolutely correct. You can always go back, or you can, you know, when I'm, when I'm scanning a, a, a big range of photographs, I may actually scan a particular photograph in a couple of different re resolutions. I may scan something at, I, 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 unless something is like an 8 by 11, sometimes you have this giant print, um, in, in which case I'll scan at 400 PPI. But I scan all of my photographs at 600 PPI, unless they're too small and I need to enlarge them. And so your point is well taken. And so above 600 PPI, you might be picking up some things you don't want. But if you down the line want to do some conservation work on a used copy of this image, you very well may need to go as high as 1,200 PPI. But that's you know kind of a, a more rare thing. Again, don't exceed the optical resolution of your scanner. It will create scans that are not true. And so look in your, in your, um, look in your tech leaflet that comes with your, uh, your scanner or go onto their website and find out what the optical resolution, both the maximum and others are. You can, you can always email me and ask me a question about this. It's perfectly fine. So the only downside of scanning things at 600 PPI is that when you double the PPI, it could quadruples the digital file size. But you, know, you can go out to Best Buy and buy a 4 terabyte external hard drive for 150 bucks. So, you know, it, space is really not a big issue when we're dealing with this. Now, you, there may be some of you who are sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I scanned all of my photographs at 300 PPI. Well, um, you know what? I did the same thing years ago. 
and I just simply bit the bullet and went back and scanned them all at 600. And it was just now I've got an image that I can scale up, I can scale down, and it's just it's just perfect. Your uh, what what you do is completely up to you, obviously. Well, let's talk a little bit about some basics. Have you calibrated your scanner? Have you considered that? Oh, can this? Yeah. Just one more question before we move on. Uh, yeah. It's uh, somebody asks if someone requires a 600 DPI image and they also wish to double the size from two by four to four by eight. Would I still scan it at 600 DPI? Oh, excellent question. No, that scaling thing requires you to double the resolution. So if they want, if they want it to, if they want to use, of course they're not going to be able to really use it at 600 PPI because there's no output device on the planet that can produce that. But let's just say, let's just say for fun, they're like on the Starship Enterprise and they have a printer that can print at 600 dpi. So if, the, you, if they wanted to upscale it times two or increase the size of that photograph, double it in size in from the original to the output on the printed page, you would have to scan at 600 ppi times two or 1200 in order to not upscale that image. Now the more realistic thing is there they want it at 300 dpi so that they can, uh, I mean they're going to print it at 300 dpi and so um, you'd upscale from there. More realistic because nobody can print at 600 dpi. So calibrating your scanner. This is a fabulous IT8 scanner calibration target. And they come both for reflective images, print images, and then a different one, a different kind of IT8 target for film or negatives. And if you want your colors to be lifelike, to be realistic, um, you have to calibrate your scanner. And so you buy one of these things, and there's, um, depending upon the software that you have, <laughs> there's ways to calibrate it. But that's really, you really, really need to do that. I went for years not calibrating my scanner, and the difference is mm, probably nominal, but it's, it's real. And if you're really getting into color calibration, you also calibrate your monitor and you also calibrate your photographic, your photo quality inkjet. And so all three of those are calibrated together so as to create uniform color. Well, that's kind of hoity-toity, I know, but uh, if you want to do that, it's important. Scan from the earliest generation of photo that you have. Don't use like a photocopy of, a, of the original. And if you have multiple copies, use the one that's in the best shape. And it's important. Our, our desire is to scan this image once. That's why we're scanning at the highest possible resolution we'll need. Because scanning takes a lot of time, it's wear and tear on the original photographs, and you don't want to do that. So we're going to create master images, master copies of these digital images, and from those we're going to use, create use or copy images. And we'll talk about that now. Basically, you're going to want to create these master images and store them offline. Really, the purpose of this master digital file is only duplication and preservation. So let's talk about that so it makes some sense. So you scan your image, and you want to save this as your official digital copy, particularly particularly if you are working in a government environment, this is an official record. And so you can't adjust or change this original 
image. You want to scan it pretty much as it is. And you would store that master image as a TIFF file. Because as we'll note in a moment, TIFF files have various properties that will allow you to preserve them more easily long term. Once you've created your master images in a TIFF file format, you can then create use or access images. So let's say you want to use it on the website, in a um, slideshow, you want to send it on an email, or, or even put it in a publication. Generally speaking, one would use a JPEG image. They're smaller. They don't take up as much space. And so we're really trying to think about two different things. My master copy that's stored away offline on a hard drive or a server or in a bunker or in a granite vault in Salt Lake City, that is the master image. And you don't mess with that. That's your preservation copy. But from that, you can duplicate it. And quite honestly, if you have to do, uh, if you want to do some repair work or some conservation work or some enhancement, you don't do it on the master copy because that's your photograph, your copy of record. Personally, when I do this, I have my master TIFF, but I make a copy of the TIFF and I make a copy of, and I create a, J, a JPEG copy as well. So if you want to manipulate, clean up, restore a document or a, an image, you, A, you're not using your master. But you also wouldn't want to do that with a JPEG image. You'd want to do that with a second TIFF image because it provides a much better platform to make significant changes or um, enhancements. But anyway, I, I, I could go on forever, and I won't do that here. So here's the deal. Oh, Kent, uh, there's one Please. question here from Rebecca. Are the photos eligible for disposition after the master image is identified and archived properly? Wow, read that again. Uh, are the photos eligible for disposition after the master image is identified and, quote, archived, unquote, properly? Well, if we follow records management law, I would have to say yes, because our law or regs state that one may retain a record copy in any format. I, I generally wouldn't throw out the original photograph because it may be in later years, you may want to do something with it that you cannot do with the scan that you took, like maybe in like 150 years or some new cr cool thing. And anyway, um, yeah, it's sort of like your minute books. You probably wouldn't throw your minute books out after you'd scanned them, um, but well, I won't say anything more. I'll just step in it if I do. So let's think about compression. Compression is a uh, computer yes, process. Me, yep, uh, go ahead. Carol uh, also, she says, said, can you repeat about which file to use for preservation? Yes, absolutely. So let's let's think about this because I'm um, because of my drugs, I am <laughs> I am mumbling. Um, you have your original scan, which is a TIFF format. So when you scan the images, you want to set your software to create TIFF images. So you have those. You don't mess with those. You, the only reason that you've got that is to make additional copies. So you can make a copy from that that's a JPEG copy, much smaller image, that can be used in a lot of different ways. You can also create from the master TIFF file a copy copies. I, I personally copy every single one of my master TIFF files, and I make another copy of the TIFF files 
to manipulate, clean, enhance, whatever. I don't make significant adjustments to the master copy because I may muffy something up. I may uh, change it in a way that you know I make it lighter, darker. But I, I could actually wreck it, and so I've I've made a TIFF image so that my software can better manipulate it. You can't manipulating JPEG images is very, very, very limited because of the nature of it. And so if you're doing any enhancement, if you're doing any cleanup, if you're doing any kind of restoration, you would want to do that on a TIFF copy of your master. Does that make sense? So here's the deal. JPEG, the JPEG format is lossy. When you open it, when you make copies, every time it's interpolating, it's basically removing data that is real. And when you open it back up, um, it substitutes real data for estimated information. It looks at the pixels to the right and the left and up and down, and it sort of fakes it. And it can introduce, over a period of time, distortions. And so JPEG images are just used as use images. They're not really a long-term preservation um, file format. And TIFF images are lossless in the sense when you open them, reopen them, copy them, they're not losing data. There's no interpolation. If you set it, there are ways of setting it so that it does, but you don't want that. Well, so now you've got these images. And you may have photo albums where they're on sticky or acidic paper stock. And you have to do some evaluation. Is it going to be OK simply to scan the images while still attached to their backing? Or is it sticky and it's going to get all over your scanner? You definitely don't want that. That would be living heck. But the key is you don't want to remove an image and damage it. And you know we get all excited, and maybe we've got a little micro spatula or some other piece of equipment, and we're trying to get that darn thing off the page because we don't like the backing, and we end up damaging the image. Another thing that may determine whether you scan it on the page is whether or not they're the little, you've seen the little corner deals that holds the image on the page that obscures part of the image. You don't want that. But a flatbed scanner, generally speaking, is safe and effective for most uses. Don't damage the photo. You don't want to do that. There are some instances where images are encased in frames, like daguerreotype or large oval photos, where it's not going to sit on the scanner platen right. It's too high up, and you might have to use a digital camera, shoot it from different angles, and there's different merging techniques. And in that way, you might be able to get um, a better usable image for those. You don't want to remove photographs from sealed cases because they can be damaged, and there can be chemical reactions. So you don't do that. So let's look at the uh, at scanning itself. We're going to, you, you've, you've now cleaned your scanner. You've got your white gloves on. You've turned it on. And here pops up your uh, scanner software. And so we're in preview mold, mode. And um, we're looking at some of the different scanning settings. So here you've got the document type. Is it reflective? That means a print. Or is it film? Here's the document source. The exposure type, it's a photograph. What kind of image is it? Again, we noted that it could be 24-bit color. It could be black and white. It could be grayscale. Here's the resolution. Here's some targeting information. If you want to scale it, it allows you to do that. And then you hit the preview button. This is so important. So let's preview. 
Oh, here's a picture of my beautiful, actually my gorgeous wife when she was 14. Um, you see the little dotted line around it? This is the marquee tool. This basically identifies the area that you want to scan. Now, you may have a photograph that has information, like the name of the photographer and the city, and you'd want to capture that. But in this instance, this is all this outline information really has no value. And quite honestly, if you scan it, it's going to throw the colors off of the actual image. So use the preview scan and use the marquee tool to scan only the part of the image that you want. Now here's an important thing. Here's some setting adjustments. This is the adjustment panel in Epson. Your software will vary. Some of these adjustments are not appropriate during the scan for government use. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not allowed to change the image during the scan as government entities. We have to collect or capture an exact image of the scan. That is to say, you can't really remove dust. You don't want to uh, do any color restoration. You don't want to sharpen it during the course of the scan because that would change the image and you don't do that with government imaging. However, there are a couple of adjustments that we're going to highlight that would be appropriate. But before we do that, let's talk again about RGB color channels. Remember, scanning devices do not capture color. They capture three channels, red, green, and blue, grayscale channels, and then your output device converts that to color. So let's talk about two different adjustment tools that are generally accepted appropriate with government scanning. If you're scanning at home, if you're scanning at a historical society, you know, I would make more improvements. I make the most improvements I can. But in this instance, we're talking, this is a government show. So anyway, note over here, red, green, and blue channels. And this is the combined channels. This is a histogram. Basically, from left to right, here are your shadows. Here are your highlights. And this basically is an indication of how many pixels from white to dark to black is captured by your scanner. Note the fact that this is a little this is a little deal here. There is all kinds of grayscale data that's not being captured. And the same thing here, because it's not in the photograph. So one of the techniques we're going to talk about in the histogram is sliding this slider over to where it meets that data, that hill, and this slider over to where it meets that hill. It's basically allowing your scan. This is the default. This is what the default your scanner sees. But what we're doing is we're adjusting the shadows by moving this over here. And we're adjusting the highlights from this over to here. And this ensures that the tonal depth of what the scanner captures is complete. It's gathering all of the detail. What you see here is what the scanner has done on its own. But you're just making a fine adjustment uh, because you're much able to do this than the machine. And uh, so we'll look at an example. So this is Silverfast. It is a higher quality scanning software. It's a professional quality software. Really, really amazing. But you'll notice, again, here's the red, green, blue channels. And I have scooted that shadow marker all the way over to the data. I'm not cramping it. And I've scooted this one over there. I'm going to do these individually. Here is the green. Well, that is the red channel. This is the green channel you see down here that we've scooted it over. We've done that manually. And here we've done it with the blue. Oh, I'm kind of cramping the data over here. All right? And so this allows your scanner to capture a full range of shadows and highlights 
in each of the red, green, blue. You can also adjust them together here, but it doesn't give you quite the same, quite the same impact. That's a histogram. One more tool. This is the tone correction, or we refer to it as curves. I think in uh, Karen, um, some of the folks uh, weren't, a, weren't able to see what you were doing in the previous uh, slide. Really? And then Barbara was also asking if uh, if the original photo was black and white. No, the original photo is color. And what what we've done here, you see the little white slider. This is the highlight slider here. And this is the shadow slider. Let me go back. You can see here that now this is the this is the Epson interface, which isn't quite as good. You see that the shadow slider isn't all the way up to that data. It's going to collect it's going to try to collect data from this thing that doesn't exist. And the same thing here. The highlight slider is over here. And what we're suggesting you do is move these sliders into the data so that it collects what's there. I, 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 it's hard to explain exactly. And you see how these now are snugged up to the data? Yeah, it's, uh, I think folks are having a tough time seeing it, Kent, because uh, um, there's no pointer or anything. Um, oh, there. don't you see the sunshine? No, I think um, what you have to do is you have to click on it, and once you once you move the uh, pointer over to the screen, I'm, I'm actually using the hey, I'm okay. using the, uh, Let's the, do this. the finger pointer. But there you go. There you, now we can see it. And so you have to you have to basically touch each time. Yes. Okay. Now this is in the way. Um, so you see here where the shadow slider is off to the left of this data. This reflects the data that from highlights to darks that are ca have been captured in your preview scan. And so if you leave them like this, there is all this area of shadows and all this area of highlights that is going to mess up your scan. This is the default, the preview scan. And, w and you'll note that there's different channels. So here, what I've done is I've moved the slider over to where it's just right up against the data. And this is the, the shadow slider. It's black. Here's the highlight sh um, slider. It's, it's white. And you move that over. And this allows you, and so that's the red channel. There's the green channel. We've done the same thing there. And there's the blue channel. And just that histogram adjustment alone is going to remarkably improve the quality of your scan. That's the biggest secret on the planet. And the key is, if we're in a government setting, I believe, as do most, that this is not changing your image. It is allowing your scanner to collect a full range of tones, red, green, and blue, and basically allows you to create a better scan than you would if it was just default. So that's the histogram tool. This is the tone correction or curves. This, well, let me show you. This is so cool. You see here. You see the little slider in the middle? This is referred to as midtones. It's not shadow. It's not highlight. It's midtone. And you could conceivably adjust this in each of these histogram settings. But it's the biggest pain. And you're not going to get a quality um, thing. So what you do, there's this what's called curves or tone adjustments. And this works more specifically with midtones and contrast. And this, too, is a tool um, that allows you to capture the greatest amount of information in the image without changing it. Now, in government settings, it's recommended that when you make a tone correction using curves 
or a histogram adjustment that you note that in your metadata, which we'll talk about in a second. Oh, we're running so far behind. So look at this. This is the original preview. And this is the enhanced scan using the histogram and the curves adjustment. It's simply bringing out the true colors that are in the image, but the scanner cannot see on its own without you helping it. And you can see it's much more natural. This is a huge, now this takes time. But if you want to, and, and these changes can be made um, after scanning with, with the appropriate software. But it's, you know, this is the best thing you can do. Kent, we have a couple of questions. I love the questions. There's so many questions today. <laughs> Jock asks, since you can do the same histogram <laughs> adjustments after scanning, is it better to adjust before scanning or after? It is totally better to do it before because then you're capturing the full tonal values that are in the photograph. You cannot manipulate what data you don't have. And so you can do a lot of good enhancement or enhancements on a photograph. Again, if it's a government photograph, you'd want to use it and do those enhancements in a use copy. But you're going to have the biggest benefit by scanning it properly up front. And here's another secret that is so very important. You note here, here's a, a black and white photograph. Whenever I scan black and white photographs, I always scan them in RGB color rather than grayscale. I may, I may also do it in grayscale if there's absolutely no work that has to be done on the image. But I always, 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 always scan black and white images in RGB color. And the reason for that, think about it again. Your scanner's not ca actually capturing color. It's capturing three channels of grayscale. So if you need to do any enhancement to the use copy, you need to clean it up or organize it. This one had all kinds of crazy scratches and it was just a mess. If you want to make any enhancements to that, scanning it in color provide you with three times the data than if you scanned it in grayscale. Now, I know that kind of blows your mind. And again, if I have a very nice, pristine black and white image, I'll often just scan it in grayscale with the color just for fun. Also, Kent, uh, Pamela asks, can you explain how the curve adjustment works? Oh my gosh, no, I can't. <laughs> you you need to go to lynda.com and take a class because it's, um, yeah, you see, if you move this thing, this, this, this is, again, um, over here are shadows, and over here are highlights. And you can go along various, this from here to here is just like the histogram. You remember how there was hills and stuff? This adjusts, like at this point, will adjust darker midtones. And this will adjust lighter midtones. So as you move this little deal, and you can do it as a group here with the three channels together, or you can actually ad adjust the three different separate RGB color um, channels. But as you move it back and forth, you will lighten or darken it. And again, you're really just, you're doing this in the preview scan so as to capture the right amounts of highlights and shadows in the midtone range. But this is very a very sophisticated tool. And depending upon the software interface, um, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, so I better keep scooting because I'm already over time. So photographic software. 
you know, there's a lot of different software products that you can use to help you manage and in some instances with your use, copy, um, correct, manage, help, whatever. And so Microsoft Office Picture comes free with the Microsoft Suite. At least it did up till 2010 version. This is a great little, I, I, I use this more than anything. It's just really fun. Photoshop Elements is a great tool. This is fairly inexpensive. It's a stripped down version of the full Photoshop product, which is extremely complex to learn. And you can buy it for, let me get my notes, you can buy it for $89, which is really cheap. That's amazingly cheap. No, it's $80. You can go on Amazon and get Photoshop Elements for $80. Lightroom is another product. It actually has a database also. Very, very robust. This complements elements. Um, and it only cost $115. This is, Adobe Lightroom is really a fantastic product if you don't want to spend a billion dollars and you need something to actually manage the images and be able to manipulate your use copies. But all of these are really great. Photoshop is super too, but it's very costly and complex. Let's talk for a second about naming your files. You need to come up with some kind of a unique identifier for your file names. And there's all kinds of different ways to do it. This is a very simple one. <coughs> this is my, uh, this is one of my great uncles. This is Lulu. It's so sad. Lulu died in the, uh, in the 1918 flu, uh, influenza, Spanish flu. Very sad. Anyway, so here's just a very simple way. MIL, it's a Miller. Uh, it's the 55th image, and it's a TIFF file. Very simple. This is another strategy. Perry and Lulu Miller, obviously, you're identifying these people. It's a grayscale image. This image was scanned in grayscale, and it was scanned at 300 PPI. Boy, I wouldn't do that anymore. And here is a very complex um, professional level file name that the New York State Archives would use for this image. And so there's all kinds of different ways. And some people like to put the date in it as well. So you come up with that identifier. Well, you're also going to want to create metadata. And your scanner will actually automatically create metadata. This is the information the computer or the scanner creates that tells you what the image is about and who made it, what kind of equipment it was, uh, it was made on, what format it is, and how it was digitized. So you can also add metadata to your images. Your scanner will create some, but you can add metadata in various software programs. So for example, in the, in the Adobe Bridge, which is a free software that ships with Photoshop and Photoshop Elements, as well as Lightroom, I believe, you can actually add this information. You've already got your file name. You may give a title to your photograph, who the creator was, if you know who was the original photograph. You can add subject terms. This is so important because you want to be able to search for um, you may have an image that has clouds and rainbow and rain and sky and mountains. And in this way, using various softwares or online search tools, you'll be able to pull that up. Maybe a, a more lengthy description of the image, the date of the original, the location that it was shot at, the physical location. You may have a, um, a field that talks about people who is in it. Kent, uh, excuse me, uh, Kara asks what the name of the metadata tool was. Was it Adobe? Um, the two ones that I think are really fantastic is the Adobe uh, Lightroom. That allows you to manage it. And also the free um, software, Adobe Bridge, allows you to create metadata. And that ships free of charge with either, either Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, and I think Lightroom. And so um, basically Adobe Bridge or Adobe Lightroom is, is where, you would, where you can 
add and manage this. And it's really, really straightforward, really helpful. So here's here's this. And it really I mean if you if you can't find your stuff, then it's not really very helpful. <clears throat> well, here are some great uses for digital photographs. You may have presentations, you may have um, educational exhibits or slideshows. Really, really super way to use these. Um, you may be creating publications and websites, family histories, uh, newsletters, local histories. You may have a fabulous historical web page for your local government or organization. Also, there are professional level um, websites such as Flickr and New York Heritage that you might be able to use. Flickr, there are, you know, you can create your own page. Here's a sample of the New York State Archives um, photo stream. They, you can also do subscriptions with them. New York Heritage is a really, really amazing tool where different organizations are basically created a consortium to mount their historical um, images on the web. And so it's like a subscription fee. It's very reasonable from what I understand. And it allows you to, and so libraries, historical organizations, uh, local governments use it to basically mount their historical images, making them accessible to the public. Uh, Kent, um, Rebecca asks, is the metadata process more or less like doing a MARC process? Uh, MARC is a lot more difficult a lot more difficult. Um, punching in the metadata is not as cerebral. Um, it's much more logical. Um, it's like when you pick up a photograph and you know what the content and the people and the place and the information is, you, you're not having to visit some publication um, to absolutely conform with a MARC protocol. It's more logical. And, um, but I will say that if you're, if you're punching in um, subject terms, you know that there are resources to create very uniform and generally accepted um, subject terms, whether it's Library of Congress or this or that. And those are online, and you can get access to those. But no, it's much, much, much less complex than uh, mark coding. Totally simple. And you might be able to use it in, in social media. Uh, local governments are creating their own um, Facebook pages, um, historical organizations. And so you can use those in those settings, as well as personal uses. I use my images in uh, online genealogical sites on uh, my own newsletters and, and stuff. So there's a lot of different ways you can use those. <clears throat> Finally, we will note that um, you may have images that are a mess. They're torn. They're damaged. There's, there's fading. There's color um, skews. And so again, in a government setting, we don't mess with the master because it is the official copy of record digital wise but and so we create a use image and you can enhance your photographs lighten or darken create the contrast sharpen them improve the color uh, correct the skin tones and you might even repair some touch up the scratches and cracks or remove dust put together torn pieces and recreate missing information um, this is really a beautiful field I, I love digital restoration of photographs, but um, do that on your use copies if you're a government agency. But this could be a whole workshop in talking about this. And again, using Photoshop or Photoshop Elements or um, Lightroom, you can do a lot of these different things. Well, that's it. I'm, I'm, that's the whole banana. Um, I hope you'll look for us in the spring. I think that we're going to pick this up in March um, and present some more in this series. Any final questions? Oh, let me give you 
this, let me just do this. See if I can write this. Uh, let's see if I can write. Also, Kent, while you were saying that, I just wanted to remind people that before they left, if they could just uh, type in the number of participants in the chat box that were sitting in with them. And we'll be sending you a brief survey so that uh, we can learn from you what you thought about our webinar and how we can improve. Please feel free to um, email me if you have questions when you start or give me a call. Um, my email address is Kent, K-E-N-T, dot Stutz, S-T-U-E-T-Z. Here, I'll type it right in. Oh my gosh, I could, I could do this. K-E-N-T, S-T-U-T-Z, at nice dot gov, or call me, 315-542-5909. Um, you, pro you, you basically pay for my cell phone, so uh, please feel free to uh, contact us, or contact us, that's what I meant to say. I'm really, really happy. Will you be supplying a confirmation that we participated in this workshop? Not at all. If you would like a confirmation that you participated in this workshop, please send me an email, and I have a little um, a little letter I'll send you. Rebecca, how are you? That's who you are, Rebecca Remington. Good to see you. Um, we'll be sending out emails in the uh, at the end of winter that will introduce the. Um, webinars that will be produced in this foundation series during the spring. You're very welcome. Thank you.